Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today at the UX interview. I really appreciate your time. So, Los, I think I should start from asking you um, who you are and what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. My name's Ross Chapman. I'm head of design at Abodo, which is a product design studio. And I am a facilitator, um, product designer. I've been running 150 plus design sprints, um, more focused in remote and hybrid environments. And I'm really aware and kind of leaning into this more kind of remote and hybrid world that uh, I call the Wild West. We're kind of inventing it as we're seeing it, yeah. um, backed by technology. But really the important thing that I'm keen on is bringing people together wherever they are into a shared uh, direction, into a way that they can collaborate, which may be the first time they've ever done that. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you ignoring Siri and um and really just trying to make work work and um you know either as a facilitator or a head of design managing uh, freelancers through design projects mm -hmm. and um yeah just trying to be as valuable as I can I um that's a very interesting I mean you've you've been learning uh, physical workshops like you said like hundreds of them um, I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that um, whoever watching this video uh, knows the definition of what is hybrid uh, workshops. The, the way to your question I would describe a, a hybrid workshop is one where, where you have a workshop or a design sprint where some people are working from home, mm -hmm. some people are together in an office, and actually, location isn't important. They're essentially bringing together themselves, wherever they are, into a shared workshop. Mm -hmm. What that implies is that workshop is able to be as valuable to each of, of those participants, wherever they are, and ultimately with whatever tools that they have. So... Typically right now, some people are going back to the office, some people are working from home, and that's what a hybrid setup might look like. Uh, but I like the way that Simon Sinek describes it, where you may have a workshop coming up, something happens that day, and you're still able to join that, whether you're, you're stuck on the train, uh, you've accessed it via your phone, um, or, or you've been able to, to get to somewhere with other participants. So I think really hybrid means uh, and implies flexibility in how you turn up and how you contribute. You're implying that all, not all the participants don't have to be in the same workshop at the same time? Hi hybrid can be taken to a conversation about synchronous and asynchronous uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. So. A asynchronous is when everyone's together, they're, they're talking in, in the same space at the same time. And asynchronous is in their own time, wherever mm -hmm. that is. And typically that could be anywhere in the world. So I think hybrid lends itself more to a synchronous, asynchronous conversation. And typically the workshops I run, we, we do together time, which may mm -hmm. be 45 minutes together. And then we have more asynchronous communication, which may be through Slack, through Loom video recordings, through uh, a poll or voting. And I think that where we would say work is done within the workshop, work can continue likely at a different pace outside of the workshop as well. So I think mm. to answer your question, hybrid lends itself to more of a, a synchronous and asynchronous setup, I think. All right. It kind of makes me think about that. Um, when you think about workshops where everyone get together and then everyone try to contribute to the maximum level, but we can, we can also say that uh, some people, maybe the core member of the workshop participants, but also others can join after the workshop ended as a uh, kind of adding some afterthought or something like they can contribute in a different way or different levels as well. 
I think that that is the case. I think the skill at with the facilitator or the person running that that work stream is the type of activity that lends itself well to that uh, decision making you really want to make together. Um, the, the way to get there might be through voting and bringing together ideas and sketching and and you know diverging um, if, if you're talking about design thinking. But the together time needs to be when you converge on, on a situation. I find that's been challenging to do that asynchronously. Mm. But what you can do asynchronously uh, is you can do that diversion activity. You can research, you can sketch, you can uh, use a test, you can do multiple activities. But ultimately, through that, you need to converge on a central point. Uh, or a central decision. And that's where I think togetherness helps. Now, when that comes into a hybrid situation, I, I would say, yes, you, you have to be together in the same time. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's the same conversation we used to have. Can you record this session? Because no, you know, this person hasn't been able to come. If that person then watches that video later on and they have a further decision to make, then they have to then schedule another session to go through that or it, it disrupts the the kind of decision flow of how that project is going so i think with any, anything i'm i'm thinking about building momentum and keeping momentum uh throughout any decision making process and how a facilitator can help manage that you mentioned that you're going to facilitate workshops coming up next week and also you probably have run a work hybrid workshops or remote workshops that are involving after people who are joining from uh, remote places. Can you tell us about a little bit um, about yeah how you how you run it and also what you maybe learned or how how did you make sure that um, the workshops are successful? So yeah, I yeah, throw absolutely. away in a lot of questions there. <laughs> No, I, I like questions uh, and and do do keep on asking follow on if, if do, things don't doesn't make sense. Um, don't make sense rather. I, I like to start the workshop in a way that we start on day one with going into what we want to achieve. But that often means before that day one workshop, you need two or three sessions before then which I use as a tech check because I want to make sure that people can log into the space, wherever that's Mural or Miro or Butter or, or Zoom or whatever tool. And I want them to become more comfortable with that way of working because most of this is brand new to people. Uh, startups are a little more up together, but more enterprise, this is, this is the world that's been flung upon them uh, rather than they kind of uh, opted into it. And those tech checks I disguise as the first session would be an introduction session. We'd get to know each other. The second session would be uh, what's coming up? What does next week look like? These are the kinds of things uh, that, that you can uh, be a participant of. And then if there was a third session, I'd say uh, we, we want you to prepare something for next week. Maybe that's a lightning demo or, you know, just seven minutes to talk about your specialism as a form of together research. And to the team, that sounds sensible. It sounds like, yes, we need to do introductions and, and yes, we want to know what to expect. But for myself and my team, it's about looking at who is getting engaged, who can you know, create a sticky note within our, our virtual space, who's having like challenges that we can broach and help them. And it's all about increasing the uh, opportunity for a successful workshop going into that, that week. So the workshops start a week before when we do our, our preparation. And I think to maintain that and ensure that we're we're getting, I I use um, within a Bodo Net Promoter Score at the end of a, a, a kind of series of, of workshops and the end of a project, we ask what what you know Net Promoter Score would you give us? Would you recommend us to a a friend or colleague? 
and that I I need to think about how do I reverse engineer that? How do I get you know a five star review at the end? And so we use activities to engage and make sure that people are having fun, but they're also getting into the problem space. We ask questions more than once. I, I use the five whys, you know, why are we here? Oh, we're here to do this. Yes, but why are we here to do this? And you ask why five times to get to the, the kernel of the problem that we're trying to solve. And I guess finally, it's the, the workshops, we do the work and the program of activities happens and that's a repeatable formula. I've, I've done it more than a hundred times. Our team have done it, um, you know, nearly a hundred times. And I think that the key thing is just being available to do something together that they enjoy. People will opt in and engage further if they enjoy the activity. And actually, if, if anyone's starting their first workshop and the invite list gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it's because they think that what you're doing is really exciting. They want to get involved. It's then your skill to maybe limit the amount of people in there to about seven or eight. Uh, so those are the kinds of things I would look at to uh, prepare and briefly manage a successful workshop. Mm -hmm. How this activity works when you're running um, hybrid workshops? I think with hybrids, you're you're able to have a hybrid workshop without kind of signaling that it is hybrid. So the typical situation I find myself in is either some of the team are individually remote and then two or three of the team are in the same room. And I've seen them mute all their microphones apart from one. Uh, I've seen some people huddle together around one computer, which is really hard for them to individually collaborate in a space. And the, the way that I, I try and kind of in, ensure that everyone's able to have a an equal voice, and that's really the goal of any workshop, is everyone has an equal voice. I personally think that's much easier in a remote environment because if you've got a computer, a webcam, and a microphone, you're as equal as everyone else. Uh, in, in a more in-person situation, I think titles and roles get a little more amplified somehow, and uh, it's quite hard in person to mute someone. <laughs> um, <laughs> or just kind of talk through what they're saying, I guess, yeah. uh, which is just plainly rude. Um, I think I think the, the way to kind of mitigate that is, is be patient. Uh, this is a brand new way of working for most people. Uh, use, use playful activities. And yeah, in that situation where some people are together, they will suck the kind of gravitational pull more to that space than kind of spread across the, the team. So I, I use a few techniques to, to help ease that. And, you know, one of the things I do, say we're, we're introducing ourselves, I would say, hi, I'm Ross, I'm head of design, and I'm here to have a great time and lead this project. I'm going to pass to um, Melissa or Charles or whoever's in the room. And just using that technique, you're able to share how people are going to introduce themselves in an equal way mm -hmm. so that you don't get this kind of deluge of information from someone that might have might seem to feel like the, the gravity is more with them I think it's just about you know as, as Douglas Ferguson would say controlling the room being able to share what the process is and the structure and how people need to fill it you know, that, that's why I treat workshops as templates. You, you create a workshop and then you need to fill it with your content, just like writing a tweet in, in one box. It's, it's that kind of thing. When people know how to contribute, I think you get a much better outcome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that uh, you, you don't necessarily have to signal this workshop is hybrid. It's, it's the same whatever format the workshops are we share the same purpose we, which is to which is to make sure everyone has the equal voice 
um, because what I hear or what I experience personally is um, it doesn't have to be actually workshops, it, it, even in a meeting. Like mm. now, some people, some of us will go to um, office and then work and then join a meeting in being in the same room. And then some of us are joining us, joining the meeting, dialing in from Teams or Zoom or yep. whatever. Then uh, um, it's hard to make sure that um, those who are dialing in to have the, yep. the, the space and time to, to voice their opinions because um, mm -hmm. there is a time lag between us in the same room and then those uh, in, a, in a virtual space. Um, so how do you make sure that, um, yeah, it's, it, it, for me, it's quite hard to kind of, mm. yeah, how, how do you do it? I'm still learning. I'm on call with a team uh, earlier today mm -hmm. and I reminded them all to uh, come into the session with a computer next week mm -hmm. because some people look at a, a Google Meet link or you know some some kind of um, togetherness space and they think that they don't need to be as present as as maybe is implied and they'll just phone in and right now technology means that if you phone in you're actually at a disadvantage mm -hmm. because you can't easily see what's going on and our workshops are highly visual i treat workshops and meetings and actually any work process as what is the ikea instruction manual to this mm -hmm. like how do i make it really easy for people and I get the same questions all the time. You know, when are we meeting? What are we talking about? Have you got the agenda for that? And, you know, people laugh when they run workshops and someone asks the agenda because that's not what a workshop's all about. You, you mm -hmm. kind of gravitate around the problem and then you, you find out areas to go in as long as you've got some kind of rough semblance of uh, a structure. So I, I listen, I respond, I... I, I point out the elephant in the room. If I find that that someone is is being really quiet and they're the decision maker, I will I will I will ask, hey, you know, uh, Masato, what what do you what would you say about this? Does, does this align with the business objectives here? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I I guess I guess I I I would like to have more of a calming nature in some of the sessions that I'm in because it can very easily get very hectic. And I, I don't want to be in a session like that. I want to, I want to give a, a sense of calm and we will do the work, but we need to do it in a way that we're all comfortable because when we're comfortable, we can start opening up. I don't even care if people turn off their, their video cam. That is absolutely fine. Part of the reason where I like a more flexible approach to work is if you're not feeling like being in front of people, you can choose not to be in front of people, but you can still do whatever you need to do or take a sick day, like do what you need to do. I think the power is more with the employee now and employers are finding that friction and trying to, you know, build around that with their culture or, or slightly adjust their mission statement. And I, I think I think there's a revolution happening. That is a radical shift. And I think some companies have been overreaching and, and you know, you, you hear of some companies that give you all these benefits to keep you at work. And I think, you know, that that, that needs to flip to, you know, tell us what's important to you. Is it more time or is it more money or is it, you know, more flexibility or, um, you know, less constraints around the, the role that you do just being a kind and listening person is is a great start to uh, preparing and running any any work session whether that's hybrid in person or remote mm. I mean that's so true like because you can feel that um you can say someone's being quiet and you can just you can just call call them like hey like what you think about this what would you say? And then that really just brings up uh, improved inc inclusivity. It's such a small thing and simple thing, but oftentimes people are also afraid of doing it. I feel like when, they, when you're actually in the space, I feel like, oh, should I say this? Or should I just wait for someone to, to, 
to speak up about this kind of thing. But I guess, yeah, you have to do it、um, if you want it to make、Absolutely. the space. Inclusive. Yeah, and welcome mistakes and accidents. Like some someone earlier asked me to record the session, and I did that, and then Chrome froze, and I had to reboot my computer.、Mm. But I mitigated that by having、uh, other people from my team there. But I think you have to mis- accept mistakes. It's、mm-hmm. it needs to be less of a presentation and more of a collaboration. Like、mm-hmm. we're working together. It is not a I've prepared this work and I'm going to talk for the next hour about it. That that is presenting. That that is not collaboration. So, I I, I welcome accidents. I make mistakes all the time. Pe- people think I'm faultless, but honestly, those that work with me know that I I make really silly mistakes all the time.、Um, but that、learns. that is how we learn. That、yeah. that is how we get better. And and it. And like you say, it's human. It's it's what everyone else does too. So,、mm. a workshop starts. I get kind of like, oh, is it going to be okay? Is everyone going to show up, or are we going to have to like move it? And、um, yeah, it's good for the heart rate.、Um, <laughs> I I I think you've just got to love what you do and and、yeah. appreciate. I appreciate the opportunity that the internet and situations like this brings. So、mm. um, yeah, I'm just thankful really. Yeah, because like you said, you are、um, your clients or your team are thinking of、um, doing remote workshops before the pandemic.、Mm. So it was like quite, kind of a natural, I guess,、um, direction that the workshops are heading. That、um, everyone, people are working from lots of different places, but we still want it to get together to. To、um, make decisions, or do brainstorming, or be creative, Justin. People usually look for comfort backwards. They usually look at what has happened in the past, or what their family has done, or what a hero of of theirs has done, and they say, "I want that," and that's what they've done. And it's usually in the past. It's it's much less comfortable going to the future and trying something new, and because you could may be made a fool of, or. You know, something really bad could happen. You could, you know, get a warning, or、um, you, you know, there there could be a big problem. And I think, I think it's just managing risk and getting over that fear. I mean, this 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 is easy. Like we're not solving world conflicts in in these situations.、Um, you know, we, we're just trying to solve product problems or challenges with some kind of design or technology. And、um, yeah, I I think I think just perspective is really really useful in those situations.、Mm. I also remember you said you envisioned the future workshops, especially when it comes to remote workshops. You think you said that you can bring in the data into workshops, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. What? How do you how do you do that? <laughs> What kind of data or Well, yeah, I, I, I ran a、uh, track at Google Relay, which was、um, Google's last、uh, sp- design sprint conference. It was remote、uh, because we can travel, and、um, the the area that I ran, the track that、um, I, I coordinated, was about bringing data into design. And I had some fine folks at Google show us a little bit about what that looks like, and. I think the, you, the the technology is coming. The the ways of working are coming. They're not quite accessible right now. But essentially, I I see a a future where we reduce guesswork. And any design project usually starts with an assumption. So I think this. I think this to be true. We're we're going to prove that this is true or not. And the data usually comes at the end. Or, or close to the end. I think when you can start with data, and actually form the problem around the problem statement around data, you're starting in a great place. Projects usually start. We feel we need to do this. We need a. We need to improve our checkout. We need a better version of our phone because I want to be proud about it when I talk to my friends and family at the weekends, and I can show them that it's much better.、Mm. Um, 
they're usually the places that the projects and and work streams come about it it's starting and startups and and large tech companies do this much better facebook only does this they only design against data mm. and i think that will become mainstream i think when we're uh, planning our two two year goal or when we're trying to ascertain what questions we need to answer it will come from data and the gaps in our data or, or something like that and you know when we're when we're sketching or prototyping I, there have been experiments airbnb did like this um kind of um artificial intelligence um prototype and it no one drew anything or, or created boxes it it was just a machine making this stuff. So I think I think that's where it's going. I think that's that's why I know the way that we work and design will continue to evolve um, with technology. And mm. you know, I'm not looking to get out the, the post-its and and sticky, you know, sticking dots and things on anything anytime soon because the, the world and our products are getting ever more complex. Our needs and, and behaviors are getting ever more complex. And we need a tool to help with that. And that is this computer thing or this thing in our pocket. That's, mm. that's our enabler. And this should do the hard work so we can think and, and, and help each other. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there, there are things that are coming up. I'm seeing... Uh, virtual reality workshops where you you just put on glasses and you are in an experience and that that it can either be a uh, an experience for a workshop participants or it's enabling you to visualize data in, in a new way uh, i've seen prototypes go live in, instead of just you know here's a prototype now go go and develop it i think the advent of no code tools means that um, designers will be able to develop using no code and and launch mm. and nothing will be in a simulation jason freed says anything before launch is a simulation it's it's not real mm. i think the gap between idea or or need through data to getting in the market is just going to be reduced all the time and the way of doing that is going to become more accessible so yeah, it's it's a fun future. Uh, there's a lot to get involved in, and um, uh, you know we think th things work fast right now. I think they're they're going to get ever faster, which is just crazy to me. Um, but there we go. Yeah, visualizing data like that that is something to me very interesting um, because um, when I try to run workshops, not everyone in the in the workshops have um, had the direct experience with this data. For example, when I say data, I'm talking about qualitative data that I heard from user interviews. Then um, what kind of data we can show it to our participants would be something like uh, quotes or insights or higher level in, um, um, yeah, insights or more granular data. Um, yeah, how can we visualize this data? that they can em empathize with or mm. they can kind of spark some um, draw a line this, together with this um, different, seemingly different um, insights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, that, that's all coming as well. I think um, particularly in, in user research, tools like Dovetail make things super, super easy. Um, have you used Dovetail at all or, or no, been aware of it? of it? Yeah. Um, so a tool like that, you're able to, um, and actually we, we're doing this in Notion as well, we're centralizing research. And then you can imagine a time where there, there is some machine learning based on that research. And so you can bring together some uh, intelligence about recommendations. Right now, if we run a user test, our recommendations are again based on what we think with our expertise and our knowledge and um, what we think to be true. But I think when we talk about visualization, we're talking about so that people can understand it at any level. Like my, my children will be un able to understand whether this was good or bad or what we need to do next. And that, that will come that, you know, I have no 
um, hesitation that all of that is going to come. Our job should become easier and, and we should be more accurate in our work. Mm. What will likely happen is that we'll continue to get more specialist because mm. originally computers were meant to do our work for us. But for some reason, we've had to kind of evolve with them in, in a kind of Terminator type way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I spend a lot of time trying to make things really simple to remove ambiguity. And that, that can come from the questions that you ask users. That can come from the thing that you show users. And you have to take the rest of the team on a journey as well. And I think the skill of running a workshop is trying to make the complex as simple as possible. And that can even be around the structure of, of the session. Don't run a eight hour workshop in a remote or hybrid environment. Cut that down into three workshops so that you're gradually building up to a point. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think I think tools will just evolve. People will evolve with that. You know, some of those people are making the tools. Mm -hmm. And I think the areas that have high cost, um, long lead time and high expertise, that will be lowered. Mm -hmm. I, you know, eventually consultants per se, um, are being challenged right now because some of the advice that they give, you can actually Google uh, or you can find out yourself using, you know, accessible tools. So I, I, I welcome change and I think, you know, making things as accessible as possible means that we're able to get, get to where we need to go much, much faster. Um, mm. but yeah, I am not mystic Meg. I do not know what the future will bring, but, um, I, I can see experiments in VR. I can see machine learning. I can see more tools than ever helping us design and, and create engaging experiences and ultimately, um, help people, um, solve their problems. Mm. Yeah, that was super interesting. Uh, thank you so much, Ross. And I've learned so much learning, um, learning from you as well. So thank you very much. And that's all right. Did Did you have any questions you wanted to kind of cover through during the session? Or so from some of the teams that I talk to, some of them, even startups, they think it's extra. They don't. And I had this question on a, um, one of the communities I, I coordinate. They, they, they find it a hard time to explain why user research is going to um, help later down the line. It's going to reduce cost. It's going to um, improve um, success. Well, how do you explain the importance of user research and where do you think it's going? That's... Um... Very, very difficult question. And I myself, personally, I'm very interested in that. Um, so I think how, how I'm explaining is that we can look at quantitative data, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, um, as a qualitative researcher, I don't trust myself 100% about what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm hearing from users. But mm -hmm. by combining quantitative data, this um, this story has much more powerful value in it. Yep. And what I see when I'm working on a product, the data shows the users are not happy with the product. Mm -hmm. And why is that? No right. one knows in a company. Yep. They always think users are happy. And the quants won't tell you. They'll, they'll just see people exiting or, or you know, unhappiness metric. Exactly. And th that balance between quant and qual, like that, that's as much as I understand about research. Like I am not a user researcher. It's not my specialism. Um, but, you know, I, I understand that really you need to do quant and qual. You need a thousand, um, you know, data points on one question, and then you need interviews to, to cover the, the qual, um, to expose the behavior. 
you, you can get a bit of behavior from quant but i think you don't get the motivation behind exactly. the behavior in quant yeah. and I, it's funny how at the moment quant and quoll are kind of separate and i just wonder if there's any overlap like can you do a thousand user tests in uh you know a few hours and and get both or, or get exactly what you need i think that at scale and moderators as well like unmoderated i'm not a huge fan of because you're kind of like choose your own adventure we hope you answer the questions but and and do you know what actually unmoderated means that you can't influence their journey which is quite nice because you can't talk around you know over the gaps or anything but moderated means that you can ask about that hesitation or you can so yeah i'm i'm fascinated by it I, it's not my area of specialism but i'm i'm just fascinated by it yeah I, well i'm learning about that every day like people are asking about us um people will say oh yeah i mean i can do research i'm just going to do it by myself and then i'm just going to design it based on but um and i'm not 100 percent against it um as long as the you know we can still talking I think the thing is that, um, um, you know, our resource is limited. We can't we can't do yeah. all the research for everyone. But yeah. at least if we keep talking about what we're doing, what we're thinking, then we can kind of talk. We can learn from each other. We can develop our skills. Mm. So, same thing between con and co qualitative and quantitative as well. We normally in a enterprise um, setting, quantitative peak researchers tend to sit under marketing yeah. and qualitative data researchers sit under uh, user researchers or design or product. Of, yeah, uh, or, or data and yeah, that, just, that big just, messy team. Yeah. And the reason that we are sitting in a different places, but I yeah. think we just need to, yeah, like work together, work together and somehow it's it's funny way. that siloing of, of research. Um, I I've been in positions where the data team um, they they would use Tableau. They they would kind of um, look at the quant and uh, they were asked for direct numbers straight to the executive team for their weekly report all the time. Mm. And then the qual they were like um, you know they they did gorilla user testing. They 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 didn't seek out permission to, to go out and do, and no one was asking them to go out and, and interview people and understand their behavior. Um, so yeah, I just find it fascinating. And I was just interested in your, your point of view, but so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be great, even during the workshops, if we can combine somehow con quantitative data and qualitative data, mm as well that's what i was thinking because um that will really help us make decisions yeah sometimes we can't um prioritize things because we don't simply know the business side no. of the requirement or just in, by inviting uh different people from different departments will make huge differences in terms of the quality of the decisions that we make yeah. during the workshop um so yeah i i think by combining different kinds of data, but also making sure that everyone's again uh, comfortable talking uh, about what they know, um, as well. So yeah, that Definitely. sounds. I mean, that's yeah. What I thought about what you're, what I'm listening to to you. Great. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so if you wanted to um, give, if you wanted to do, is there anything that you wanted to kind of promote about? Um, no. no. Okay. No, perfect. Nothing. Nothing. I, I'm just, I'm just trying to do more of this, uh, and and really thank you for making this happen because it, it helps me. Um, I think, I think conversations are, are much more interesting than me just saying something um, because it, it could just be dead air. Um, but yeah, I, I've really enjoyed, you know, learning from you and, and thank you for giving me this platform. Thank you.